Hey guys, Peter Franzen here from ChristianGeekCentral.com and Spirit Blade Productions here with my uncut review of the Netflix series premiere of The Fall of the House of Usher on Netflix. By the way, if you're a horror fan, once again, a great month to jump on the $1 tier over at Patreon.com slash Spirit Blade Productions. Got some cool horror-inspired audio drama for you there this month at the $1 tier. But let's get into it here. The synopsis for The Fall of the House of Usher on Netflix, well, on IMDb, reads, To secure their fortune and future, two ruthless siblings build a family dynasty that begins to crumble when their heirs mysteriously die one by one. So I watched the first two episodes of this eight episode miniseries on Netflix. The first episode focuses on introducing Roderick and Madeline Usher, um, the, the brother and sister who are kind of the, uh, the at the head of the Usher family. And it gets into their origins, going all the way back to the 50s and then again to the late 70s. And then a lot of it, really, most of it, focuses on the present-day adult children of Roderick, six of whom we learn at the very beginning of the first episode we're going to see die during the course of this series and uh, Roderick is giving his confession to I think maybe a district attorney uh, confessing to all the things that he's done in the past with his company illicit activities and also what he believes is his hand that he played in the deaths of his children so uh, there's lots of time skipping around and jumping and stuff uh, but that's kind of the, the bookend conceit at the beginning is this is the that Roderick senior is uh, talking to uh, an attorney and kind of giving his confession um, so all these adult children of Roderick that we learn about are all selfishly pursuing ambition and pleasure and they're hungry for their inheritance kind of fighting for a bigger share of it amongst each other that's what they seem to want more than anything but when a court case appears to finally have the usher pharmaceutical company square in its crosshairs for its illegal practices over the course of decades it's also revealed that one member of the family unbeknownst to the others has become an informant to the uh, government against them in this court case. So that's kind of like the big reveal, the big, the big main elements of episode one. Episode one I thought was really strong. I had trouble with episode two, which focuses more on the youngest usher, Prospero, or is it Prospero? I can't remember how they pronounce it. Anyway, it looks like this show is going to probably d use this formula of, um, you know, it's got six, it's eight episodes, so that's six episodes to to kill the six kids, and then one at, one episode at the front to set things up, one at the back to close things off. So I'm betting very much that that's kind of the formula of this show. And episode two, um, I mean, focusing on Prospero and his story, it just was not a way to hook me in. He wants to earn respect like the older members uh, of the family, his older siblings, by uh, kind of bringing about the, his own business venture that he's come up with, this elite rave club for only the most exclusive clientele, but the event then takes a very dark turn. Meanwhile, there's flashback scenes we get uh, where with more info about Roderick, how he and his sister just started to kind of build their family fortune and get their footing a bit. And throughout it all, in these all these different time periods, there's this mysterious woman that recurringly appears to the members of the Usher family, especially Roderick, at pivotal moments of their lives and seemingly without ever aging over the decades. I get the sense that she's sort of maybe a devil figure, but we'll have to see in the rest of the series uh, who or what she really is. As far as what this basic animal is, what it feels like, well, episodes one and two felt very different f from each other to me. Episode one um, feels more ominous and supernaturally creepy with frequent specters and visions that are haunting Roderick. Episode two dials the supernatural way back and it feels much less ominous and largely focuses on the selfish and self-indulgent children of Roderick Prospero in particular, um, episode one felt like supernatural mystery. Episode two felt like ho-hum, seedy family drama with a dash of supernatural. So as a result, I may not stick with it if we're going to dial back and step back from the supernatural, creepy, ominous elements as much as they did going from one to two. That was a real disappointment for me, given how really gripping and, and uh, I found episode one and just how engaged I was with it. I checked out a lot during episode two. Um, as far as the cast, uh, you know, great, I think, performances from all. I don't have any complaints 
but I'm wondering if the cast is going to be too big for any of the actors other than Bruce Greenwood, who plays uh, uh, Roderick, and uh, I can't remember the name of the actress who was also the president in Battlestar Galactica. I can't remember her name, dang it. Uh, but she plays Madeline, his sister. I think they're the standouts, but part of that is because I think I, I've enjoyed them in things in the past, and so I like seeing them here. Um, but I, I'm just wondering if things are too spread out for everyone to really shine. Of course, you know, if they use this formula, then we're, each of these actors that plays the adult children is going to get a chance to shine. Maybe I'm just not feeling optimistic about that because I did not find Prospero to be interesting at all. Um, but that was more from a writing and story standpoint than from a performance standpoint. So, I don't know. Uh, sl solid performances, but I'm not sure if they're going to have uh, material to work with that I'm going to really find interesting. Um, as far as stunts and visuals, the effects are largely practical. The sets um, I really like and the, the, the costumes, it really sells this kind of opulent uh rich family you know for what they are supposed to be um and yeah some of the imagery that they create with these specters and visions that roderick has use color palettes and costuming and stuff that are you know really really striking and i actually like the way they're approaching kind of the supernatural elements it's not a bunch of like cg smoke swirling around and stuff no it's it's mostly done with editing and lighting and uh, creepy images and beings that suddenly appear and disappear um so i found it to be really effective even in some moments where i knew a second or two beforehand that oh they're about to surprise me oh we're about to see someone pop up in the background stuff like that even being ahead of it just a little bit i still found the imagery uh, effective and 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 striking um Okay, themes. Is there anything of moral, philosophical, or spiritual significance that might trigger some worthwhile thought or contemplation while you're uh, watching this thing? Uh, well, maybe. I mean, that's often the case in horror, where the ideas of good and evil are, they tend to bubble to the surface much more strongly than, say, in fantasy or, or even the superhero stories, at least movies and stuff. Um, the ushers are all dysfunctional, very dysfunctional, and corrupt in multiple ways, and usually there's some sexual element in the mix with their various dysfunctions. It's really interesting to see that sexual proclivities are a common point of dysfunction among these family members. However, in the mix, there is also an increased commonality of sexual proclivities that are probably not considered sinful by the writers. Um, yet they are there in the mix, leaving me as a Bible-based Christian interpreting these characters and the nature of their dysfunction with more layers than are probably intended in the writing. In the first episode, uh, Roderick's mother is very clearly religious, very in, uh, very strongly religious, maybe Catholic specifically, um, but also very superstitious and unbiblical in her convictions as whatever form of Christian she is meant to be. Uh, she refuses medication or treatment despite immense chronic pain because of her conviction that God will heal her supernaturally if he wants her to be healed. And because uh, according to her, pain and suffering are the kisses of Jesus and make us feel close to him. And that, that idea of them, pain and suffering being the kisses of Jesus, is attributed uh, as a quote to Mother Teresa. Well, C.S. Lewis, although it's not mentioned in this story, C.S. Lewis once said that pain is God's megaphone, basically to get our attention. You know, neither of those ideas are actually taught overtly in scripture. However, in different particular circumstances, depending on what is meant, both are compatible with scripture. Uh, so this is an example of how we can sort of in an unhealthy, um, unreasonable way, lock onto ideas that are circulating among Christians, expressions that circulate among Christians, and we kind of take an idea and run with it and emphasize it to the point where we're leaving scripture actually out of consideration. And that's a real, you know, uh, danger for us as Christians to be aware of. Uh, more generally speaking, like so many horror stories, this miniseries looks set up to have a strong moral built into the stories, or maybe not, if, if not an overt moral, then like um, a recognition of the consequences, at least, of selfish living. Consequences was a key word uh, in the uh, climax of the second episode. So there are, I think, springboards for thought and conversation if you're looking for them, but I definitely would not recommend watching the show for that reason, thinking that it's going to provide an opportunity to start a conversation with somebody uh, on, you know, worthwhile issues. Um, okay, I have no idea what your tastes are in TV shows, but if I were a time traveler, I'd go back in time and say, Pater. Oh, man. Um, 
watch episode one um, because you'll find it very striking. And uh, if the whole series is like that, it could really be your cup of tea. But episode two is really going to disappoint you and turn you off. So maybe just to keep track of the plot and not miss important details that you might need for the rest of the series, give full attention to episode one and then put episode two like on your computer or some small screen off to the side, play a video game and just pick up the main beats, the main beats of the story. Uh, And then maybe after that, if you still feel like it, you can give five to ten minutes to episode three to see if it hooks you in or if it's going to just feel more like episode two. And that'll tell you all you need, I think, about whether or not you want to give more time to this series because episode two just felt either boring or gross. (laughs) While actual nudity in the first two episodes is absent, apart from uh, brief graphic moments in episode two, as far as I remember anyway, The show still sometimes sits within a context of sexual themes and sexual tension to the point of just like, ugh, this is just icky, you know, about broken people, and I'm just, (laughs) oh man, I'm not really into this. Give me more of the creepy supernatural stuff. I don't need to, you know, just sit in in other people's really deep dysfunction, you know. Um, If uh, episode two is the peak of that kind of stuff, then maybe you'd find the rest worthwhile, but... I don't know. You just have to see if you decide to give any more of this show uh, any of your time. You'll probably, though, always find something else that you'd rather watch when it comes down to it, or that you'd rather do. Uh, So this one's rated TVMA for language, sex, smoking, substances, suicide, and violence. And they don't list this in there, but there is, again, brief but graphic nudity in uh, episode two. And those are all of my thoughts for now, I think, on the fall of the House of Usher, episodes one and two. Right now, I'd like to take some time to write a tune for... to write... A tune for, yeah, that pre-made rhyme. The lyrics kind of never change, but the melody gets rearranged. I never know what I'll create to say how much I appreciate. Dan Exhale, Gabriel Stinson, Brian Franklin, Olin D. Branham, Winston Crutchfield, Lee Bray, Justin D. Myers, Joel Nelson, and Scruffosaurus. Thank you for supporting me and SBP and CGC. And now to all who hear this tune, thank you as well. Please Please come back soon. Want to hear your name and song? Check out our page on Patreon. <sighs> I'd love to get your thoughts and reactions, as always, in the comments below. Please like, share, subscribe. Do that stuff that you know how to do to help this content out. I'd really appreciate that. I want to thank the Spirit Blade Insiders for making this review possible. You can get info about the benefits of joining over at patreon.com slash Productions. We're at the $1 tier this month. There's also some great stuff for horror fans. Uh, then, as always, I hope you'll check out our podcast and stay connected to all CGC content at christiangeekcentral.com as we continue to geek out and seek the truth. It is time again for Christian Geek Central's annual Game Save event, fundraising for St. Jude Children's Research Hospital, which provides free treatment for children facing life or death circumstances and shares its cutting-edge, life-saving research with hospitals all over the world. And once again this year, I'm drawing attention to our team's fundraising by performing a 24-hour marathon of video gaming that I will live stream on YouTube.com slash Christian Geek Central beginning 6 a.m. Pacific time on Saturday, November 4th. You can donate or get more info by clicking on my fundraising page in the links below, where you'll also find incentives and rewards for doing so. On top of that, I've set fundraising milestones that will unlock strange and unusual happenings as I reach them. Finally, if I reach my $500 goal by the end of Thursday, October 19th, I will do a four-hour Get Good live stream before the end of the year, playing only the most frustrating, difficult games in my collection. Now, there are some stipulations and time limits on those rewards and milestones, so quickly follow the link below to my fundraising fundraising page for all the details. Believe it or not, this makes the 10th consecutive year of Christian Geek Central raising funds for kids in great need of medical care. I hope you'll be a part of helping me and the Christian Geek Central Game Save team do some good for some kids who really need it. And then please join me at youtube.com slash Christian Geek Central for my 24-hour marathon starting at 6 a.m. Pacific on Saturday, November 4th. Hope to see you there.